happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Business Daily. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. Before we get started, let's get a quick check on today's highlights. The much-awaited details from the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal are out, and Korea is still weighing its options. And what's making headlines in global business news this week? Part 2 on China's ambitious five-year plan to boost its economy. And Google's parent company wants to start delivering packages using drones. These and more coming right up. But first, we begin with the Korean government calling for a major overhaul in the country's certification system for products and services in hopes of clearing more stumbling blocks for companies and invigorating the economy. In a regulatory reform meeting held on Friday, chaired by President Park geun the government announced that out of 203 certification regulations, it will abolish 72 that either overlap or don't meet global standards by the end of next year and make improvements on 77 others. It will leave alone only 54 that are deemed essential for the safety and welfare of the public and international agreements. The government predicts roughly 230,000 small and mid-sized companies will benefit from this change, saving a combined $475 million and increasing sales by $756 million on an annual basis. It clocks in at 6,000 pages. The full text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal is finally up for everyone to see. And the Korean government was quick to analyze this text and says that the mega trade pact is not much different from the Korea-U.S. free trade deal. Our Kim Min-ji has this report. No big surprises. That's what Korea's trade ministry said about the level of market liberalization of the recently agreed U.S.-led trade pact, adding that the TPP is similar to the free trade agreement between Seoul and Washington. The long-awaited text of the deal was released on Thursday after being under wraps for more than five years, revealing the details of a pact which will open up trade in 40 percent of the world's economy. The agreement, made up of 30 chapters, outlines a market opening rate of 95 to 100 percent on expert products depending on the country over the course of 30 years. That's about the same as the Korea-U.S. deal that requires the elimination of tariffs on 98 to 100 percent of products over 25 years. The agreement also has a chapter on e-commerce and state-owned enterprises and also has stricter rules regarding intellectual property rights, labor and environmental protection. Saying it's too early to say if the decision to stay out initially was wise or not, Seoul's trade ministry did point out that most countries in the TPP agreed to open their manufacturing sectors fully to foreign goods, which could mean more competition for Korean products. For one, the U.S. plans to scrap tariffs on Japanese electronic and mechanical products immediately, whereas the Korea-U.S. FTA eliminates tariffs on manufactured goods over 10 years, which means Korean products won't be tariff-free until 2021. The ministry says it will check the fine print more carefully and hold hearings before it makes a final decision on whether to join or not. Korea currently has FTAs with 10 of the 12 TPP countries, with the exception of Japan and Mexico. Kim Min-ji, Business Daily. One Korean company has hit the jackpot thanks to its innovative technology. Hanmi Pharmaceuticals has signed a license deal with French drug maker to develop long-acting diabetes treatments. And the company could be making over $4 billion from this deal. Our Kwon jang tells us more. French drug maker Sanofi signed a license deal on Thursday for Hanmi Pharmaceuticals' Quantum Project. It's a diabetes treatment in development aiming to turn daily insulin treatments into monthly ones. Hanmi will receive $430 million initially, but that figure could reach as high as $4.2 billion after registration and sales milestones, as well as double-digit royalties on net sales. Sanofi will have exclusive rights to develop and commercialize the treatment worldwide. However, Hanmi will maintain the option to co-commercialize the products in Korea and China. Nearly 400 million people worldwide suffer from diabetes, and that number is expected to keep growing. The treatment has yet to be approved by the FDA, the American regulatory body, but early signs indicate it will pass without issue. It has been a strong year in the pharmaceutical research and development industry in Korea. 
Korean pharmaceutical company Green Cross signed a deal to supply the World Health Organization with varicella vaccines in a deal worth $75 million, as well as a deal for flu vaccines worth $29 million. On Tuesday, it was also announced that a drug to treat high blood pressure called Canab, developed by another Korean company, Boryong Pharmaceutical, has become the most prescribed medication by cardiovascular specialists in Mexico since hitting the market last year. Kwon jang Business Daily. And more good news from Hanmi and his, for Hanmi and his shareholders is that reports on this deal sent company stocks soaring. Hanmi climbed nearly 30%, closing at an all-time high of 711,000 Korean won in Seoul trading today. And with that, let's get a quick look at more market action from today. Billions of dollars were lost in revenue for Korea's tourism industry because of the MERS outbreak that hit the country earlier this year. The Korea Culture and Tourism Institute says that the number of foreign tourists who visited the country from June to September this year dropped by 1.5 million from the same period last year. Also, from July to August, when fears of the outbreak were at their peak, the number of visitors at lodging facilities and tourist attractions slid 80 percent on year. Given that a tourist spends on average 1,200 U.S. dollars during his or her stay, the institute says Korea's tourism sector suffered losses of between 2.5 to 3.1 billion dollars as a result of MERS. The outbreak that began in May infected more than 180 people and killed 37 before it was brought under de facto control in late July. Now, if you think internet speed here in Korea is fast, you'll be excited to know that it's about to get faster. One of Korea's largest mobile carriers, SK Telecom, is currently working on delivering the fifth-generation wireless system, which is said to be hundreds of times faster than existing technology. Our Lee Young has more. What you see on the screen is a 3D model of a human heart that can potentially allow doctors to remotely diagnose patients in real time using fifth-generation mobile networks. This is a 5G-connected humanoid robot which can go on rescue missions and send real-time footage from disaster areas, all controlled from a distance with a motion suit. These are some of the technologies on display at an innovation center set up by the country's largest mobile carrier, SK Telecom. Operating under the name Playground for 5G Experience, it aims to further develop and test 5G network technologies in partnership with global IT firms including Samsung Electronics, Ericsson and Nokia. The actual bandwidth to transfer data will expand significantly with 5G technology. So just how fast is this next generation technology? SK recently demonstrated a transmission speed of 19.1 gigabits per second, which allows a 2 gigabyte movie to be downloaded in less than a second. That's 250 times faster than the existing network of 4G LTE. The telecom company has announced it hopes to become the first operator in the world to run a test network of 5G by 2017 before fully commercializing the platform by 2020. This tight timeline set forth by SK is stirring up fierce competition both locally and internationally on who will win the race to deliver the world's fastest internet speed to date. Lee Ju Young, Business Daily. And as that race continues to heat up, it looks like companies are turning to each other for more insight as well. We hear that recently Verizon, the first U.S. operator that announced plans to trial run its 5G network, has turned to Korea and Japan to discuss the technology. Now, this kind of healthy competition might just help bring 5G services to consumers sooner than later. And it's now time for a look through some of the global business stories that made headlines this week. For that, we're joined by our Eunice Kim in the studio. 
Hello, Eunice. Hello, June. All right, so part two of China's five-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, China's Central Committee released its policy blueprint this week. That's right. We are learning more information now on that plenum that happened last week. And as we do, uh, we're learning that President Xi Jinping himself delivered China's minimal growth target of 6.5 percent. So what is the so-called new normal as viewed by Beijing? Take a look. 6.5 percent or higher. That's the annual economic growth target that has been set by China's Central Committee, good for the next five years, over which President Xi Jinping will set out to firm up his legacy. The revised growth target comes as China's growth rate has consistently fallen, and it marks the start of Beijing's sub-7 percent growth era since Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping opened the country to the world in the late 1970s. In fact, the 62-year-old leader Xi, breaking with tradition, took the prerogative of explaining China's new five-year plan to his policy-making body, a task usually held by the country's premier. In the policy blueprint, produced out of the closed-door four-day meeting, also came a pledge to double China's 2010 GDP and per capita income. In a bid to ensure the growth, driven by quality and efficiency, is balanced, inclusive and sustainable, the document promised to help 100 million migrant workers settle permanently in cities, while boosting capital to pull 70 million people out of poverty by 2020. On its economy, it said it would push transparency and fair play while continuing its financial system reforms, including making their interest rates more market-based. Investors responded well to the news, as China's Shanghai Composite saw a bull run rising more than 20 percent this week from the depths of the summer's market turmoil. And countries all around will continue to watch whether the world's second largest economy will be able to achieve its so-called new normal of slower but sustained growth, as many experts cite a China recession as being one of the biggest risks to the global economy. All right. So the biggest news here seems to be the revised to 6.5 percent growth, which mm -hmm. uh, Beijing says is very achievable. Mm -hmm. But then I guess the key here is to avoid hard landing in China. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So what kind of concerns should we be looking out for? Well, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, first off, that there are a lot of skeptics out there when it comes to these official growth uh, targets or rather growth figures mm -hmm. achieved uh, reportedly by mm -hmm. Beijing and um, there are some independent estimates such as our educated guesses put uh, that put China's annualized GDP growth as low as a little over 3 percent. So some experts say it should just scrap the growth target altogether and just focus on growing. But certainly even if the growth target is lower, simultaneously transitioning into a consumer based economic model from a state centered investment model and all the while maintaining consistent growth is going to be no easy task. I think all experts agree on that. In fact, Bloomberg is reporting that private consumption right now makes up about 38 percent of China's GDP compared to the OECD average of more than 60 percent. Plus, it has collected a record amount of debt as well, which sits at about 300 percent of its GDP. Mm -hmm. And now moving on to another development in Beijing, mm -hmm. its National Congress ratified the agreement on the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Right. The National People's uh, Congress Standing Committee voted on and ratified the AIIB agreement, a legal framework, on Wednesday this week, pushing that multilateral lending institution one step closer to its formal establishment slated for the end of this year. Now, the top three shareholders are shaping up to be... No surprise here, China with a 30 percent share, followed by India with 8.5 percent and Russia with 6.7 percent. Korea is AIIB's fifth largest shareholder with 3.8 percent. 
This comes as Indonesia's finance minister on Wednesday said the bank would begin offering loans in January, some of which are expected to go toward his country's energy and power plant projects. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has a fund $100 billion deep, money to be put toward sectors that include urban construction, logistics and education. Finally from me, Google's parent company Alphabet has become the latest U.S. company to apply for permission to make deliveries using unmanned aerial vehicles. The chief officer of its drone program, Project Wing, at an air traffic convention said the company hopes to win a green light from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration to fly drones below 500 feet or 150 meters by the year 2017. U.S. retailer Walmart had also applied for drone delivery approval late last month, while Amazon and China's online retailer Alibaba have conducted testing for their robot-driven courier service this year, June. You know, I can't imagine receiving a parcel delivered by a drone. Or having drones over your head all the time. Right? Can you imagine that? Yeah, seriously. A lot technology. to be uh, sorted out still in yes. terms of traffic. All right, thank you safety. so much for coming in today, Eunice. Yeah, you bet. And that wraps it up for today and this week. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you right back here next week for your Business Daily. Have a great weekend, everyone.